Welcome to the Liberty Beacon Rant, and I am your host, Roger Landry, and I'm joined every week by the lovely and very intelligent Paula Mathers. How are you tonight, Paula? I'm doing great, Roger. Thank you. <laughs> At least I can talk, huh? Yes, and that's a good thing, because we missed you for a couple of weeks. But um, <clears throat> it's great to have you uh, audible. Uh, and tonight we're going to start a new series. And the new series uh, we're going to start today is Warfare, a Tool. And this should run, I don't know, I usually say it's going to run four or four shows and it ends up by running ten, but I'm figuring this is going to be about a six-part series. Warfare has been part of the history of this planet for as long as history has been written. And Warfare is a tool. It is a mechanism for those who wish to have to take. And it is also a mechanism for people like you and me, the common folk, to, I don't know, risk and in a lot of cases lose our lives for what we are propagandized to be either patriotism or the ultimate control mechanism, which is fear. Um, I say this because... Well, let's go back to a quote, and I don't know the exact quote, but I figure I'll get the gist of it. Uh, Ron Paul, who basically said it's not coincidence that the century of warfare perfectly coincides with the century of central banking. Over the last hundred years, prior to um, the 21st century, we saw the largest loss of life on this planet ever. And <clears throat> although I haven't done the checking on this, I would dare say that more lives were lost in the 20th century than all of the other centuries combined. And this almost perfectly coincides with the rise of the oligarchs who would play God. And we all know we just finished a very, <coughs> excuse me, in-depth series called There Are Those Who Would Play God. And these are the elite. These are the people who pull the strings on the puppets who control the countries across this planet. And it's not just the United States, although the United States has no immunity from this by a very long shot, and we've discussed that over and over again. A vast majority of what we consider to be our leaders, Congress, whether it's our representatives, our senators, or our presidents, are in fact puppets. This harkens all the way back to a quote which I probably make on every show I bring up. From Franklin Delano Roosevelt, where in 1933 he stated, Presidents are selected, not elected. Now that screams volumes right there. Because it's if they were elected, it would be we the people choosing that president. If they are selected, it is by a power that is considers itself over and above we the people. And these are the people who control the ebb and flow of capital and power across this planet. And we know that... Um, some of them are very high profile, like the Soros, um, and, and George Soros is just, just one. The Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, who have a history since the 1700s of um, dominance via the mechanism of capital over nations, over monarchs, over emperors. They have taken down monarchs. They have taken down emperors who have, not, who have chosen to go against the wishes of these elites. These are the people who rule humanity. And for anybody who doesn't think this, you've got your head buried so far in the sand it's amazing you can even breathe. Never mind see the light of day. Now, this new series we're going to bring something in that I've avoided talking about a lot because I knew we were going to gravitate into this series. And that is the mechanism or the tool of warfare. And today, as usual, 
we have a couple of links that um, we're going to discuss. And the first link is, and Paula, you did put both of those in the chat room, right? Yes, I sure did. Thank you so much, my friend. The first one we're going to discuss is the tyranny of war, the ignorance of men. Now, that sounds a little stark, but we're going to go over that. If we get done with that, I put up a link last week, and it is nuclear war. The nuclear war option is still on the table. Um, that's going to be, we're going to segue into that from the first uh, article, because the first article is going to open and define the series. But the nuclear war article was put out last week, just in case we had a chance to touch on it, and to give everybody who listens to this show regularly a chance to delve into that topic a little bit. Because when we talk about warfare, the ultimate mechanism or the ultimate form of warfare on this planet in its entire history, nothing would compare to the magnitude of a nuclear exchange. It is by far the most devastating form of warfare ever devised by man's mind to kill mankind. And when we get into this, we will discuss the fact that even a limited war, a limited nuclear war, with only 1% of either the Soviet arsenal, the Chinese arsenal, or the American arsenal, was used. We're talking 1% of any of them, not all of them combined. 1% of any of them would be enough to annihilate a massive portion of the population of this planet and put us back into a dark age humanity may never recover from. Now that's 1%. You go up to 5 or 6 or 10% and you are talking about lights out people, it's all done. Stick your head between your legs, kiss your butt goodbye, because humanity is on its way out the door. But let's start with um, defining the tool of warfare. And again, who, who would it be that could wield a tool of such magnitude when we talk about global warfare? Okay, it's not any one nation, even a nation as powerful as the United States cannot take on the entire world. We like to believe we can. We're acting like we can. I've mentioned to, uh, uh, on several shows before that out of 196 countries on this planet, there are special forces known to be in at least 136 of them, and there are some reports that say as many as 170 of them. Now, these are military forces from the United States. Whether they're active or not has nothing to do with anything at this point because they're on call. At a moment's notice, they can step up and do some serious damage. Now, but even with this type of resources, the United States alone could not take on the world. So we have mechanisms like NATO. During World War II, we had the Axis powers. We had the Allied powers. We have groups of nations that form together to achieve a goal through warfare. But on top of that, that's not the highest point of the hierarchy. On top of that, you have the people who instigate the wars, the people who perpetuate the wars, the people who fund the wars. And you have, I don't know, probably heard many times before that in just about every major war in history, the funding uh, that has come to provide the mechanisms of war, the weapons, um, paying the salaries of the men, buying the food, um, whatever, the, the, the actual mechanisms of war are funded on both sides by the same individuals, by the same conglomerates, by the same banking cabals. Because 
It doesn't matter whether you win or lose. You still have to pay that money back. It doesn't matter whether you win or lose. Uh, you still have to rebuild your country. So this is a win-win situation for those who would play God. For the... The people who control the ebb and flow of capital across this planet. And for anybody who doesn't believe that money is one of the biggest controlling factors on this planet, you need to understand that with, I believe, five at this point, five nations left on this planet that do not have a central bank-style bank, a Rothschild-style bank within their country that is controlled by the same cabal that controls these banking um, uh, entities in every country, including the Federal Reserve. If you don't believe that this is a mechanism that is utilized to pull the strings of warfare, then you haven't done enough research. Warfare is extremely profitable. Do your research. Extremely profitable to those who would play God. The elites. Those who sit at the top of the food chain on this planet. Warfare sucks money out of nations like you would not believe. The United States went into a massive debt load in World War II. A massive debt load in World War I. Germany? Bankruptcy. And then some. Every nation that participated in World War II took upon the backs of their citizens a massive debt load. Who do you think that money is owed to? Who do you think lent them the money to facilitate that war? Whether it was in a defensive strategy or an offensive strategy. Countries do not, individual countries do not have the resources themselves to perpetuate a global war. Deals have to be struck. And the deal is with the devil. The devil being the elite. So let's get into the very first article. The tyranny of war and the ignorance of men. If you think warfare is spontaneous, linked to the trials and tribulations of one country versus another, or as often alluded to, the benevolent action to rescue an enslaved or brutalized population from a despotic leader. Ah, oh, gee. Let's delve into that just a little bit. We had to take Saddam Hussein out. We had to take um, Muammar Gaddafi out. We had to take um, Assad out of Syria. I can go on. And even though I can show you and prove to you beyond a shadow of a doubt that Iraq, Iraq, and Libya were two of the most prosperous countries in their part of the world and their citizens lived at a higher standard of living than any nation around them. In Libya, when you turn 20 years old, <clears throat> excuse me, or you got married, basically, um, the government bought you a house. College that was, was free. <laughs> yes, Paula, it was nice, but it goes even further than that. Awesome. If you wanted to go... If you wanted to go to college, they paid for it. If you didn't feel that the collegiate uh, standards in Libya met your standards of, of the education you wanted to get, and you wanted to go to a, to a school in, in the UK, you wanted to go to a school in America, the government paid for that as well. They had a very high standard of living and their people, for the most part, were complacent and for the most part were happy with that standard of living and with the freedoms they had within that society. Granted, nothing is perfect. Look around you in America today. 
Your rights are gone. They are now privileges granted to you by this government as long as you live within the restrictions that allow you to practice those privileges. We've talked about this before. Out at the Bundy Ranch, the free speech corral. You wanted to speak freely? You had to go into a corral. Well, let me explain something to you. The Constitution never said there were stipulations or restrictions on my freedom of speech. So if a government is telling me in order to exercise a right to freedom of speech, I have to do it within the confines or the restrictions they set down, I no longer have the freedom of speech. If you think so, you're an idiot. And that's blatant, but it's a fact. Some of the same reasons we bombed Libya, some of the same reasons we tore Iraq to the ground and destroyed their infrastructure of both countries, and I could go on to other countries, but we're talking about these two right now. Some of the same reasons we did this, the lies we were told, for the reasons we had to do this, exist in this very country today. That's not a joke. Did you know you could go to prison for 10 years because your right to assembly is shot? And I believe it's e either HR 347 or 374. I'm not exactly sure. One of those two iterations. Google them. You'll get the, you'll get the bill I'm talking about. Who the hell do you think we would rail against in this country today if we wanted to, to run a demonstration, a political demonstration? Well, gee, that would be the government. Did you know you could go to prison for 10 years for demonstrating on government property? That's a fact. So the government has set itself above the people. This is tyranny if it's done in Libya. They don't have the right to free speech. They don't have the right to assemble. They have leaders who make laws that apply to the citizens but not to themselves and within that hierarchy. These are reasons we went in and bombed them back to the Stone Age. It was despotism. It was dictatorship. But yet you see the exact same thing being perpetrated, maybe not to the same level, but hey, give it a little while, it'll get there. It's on its way. So we have warfare across the Middle East. And we have warfare that one of the main reasons that has been used to engage in these wars over the last century and the beginning of this century was a benevolent action to rescue an enslaved or brutalized population from a despotic leader. Okay. You probably, if you believe that this is true, if you believe these reasons are true, if you believe that warfare is spontaneous, and linked to the trials and tribulations of one country versus another, you probably still believe in the Easter Bunny, too. Well, there's evidence to back up everything you're being told right now. And Roger can lead you to it. Any of the hosts here can lead you to it. This, you got to pay attention. This has got to stop. Absolutely, Paula. And I have said over and over again that when three million people, either directly or indirectly, due to the war, imperialistic warmongering of the United States across the Middle East, <clears throat> when three million plus people have lost their lives and the vast majority of Americans can't even be bothered to raise their hand in protest, where the hell is the conscience of America? Is it dead? Is it dead? Medicaid, right. as in your previous <laughs> shows, 
it's dumbed down oh. it's medicated it's it's brainwashing through tv uh, sorry i'm not trying to change the subject <laughs> but it's true but it's you know it's propagandized right out of us because even when george bush was president there were massive anti-war rallies today we are have we we are uh, perpetrating um, hostilities in more countries across this planet than probably since World War II, simultaneously, and nothing, not a not one single war rally, nothing. The only, you might see some pushback, like a show like this, or you might see an article on a decent liberty website, liberty-based website, but where are the protests? Where is the massive voice of pushback that we saw even a decade ago? It's gone. All right. Wars are a tool for both control and profit in a scenario where the winners are the large global financial institutions and the military industrial complex. Believe it. And the undisputed losers are the hundreds of millions who have died under false premises and the blatant lies of their leaders who in many cases only serve these elitist oligarchs. Now, when I say the hundreds of millions that have died, I'm not really, I can't give you an exact figure, but I can tell you that warfare is not only one nation against another. We, the, the Civil War was called a war for a reason. Okay? The civil wars that occurred in the Soviet Union, the civil wars that occurred in China, the civil wars that occurred in many nations across this planet in the last century. The century of almost total warfare. If you add up all the people that died in World War I, World War II, um, Stalin's reign, Mao's reign, if you add up all of the people who died in the Vietnam War, all of the people who died in the wars in South Africa, and I can step across the planet, all of the people who either died as a result of being killed or died of starvation as a result of the war or died uh, for, uh, uh, due to lack of health care or died, I would guarantee you we're talking about hundreds of millions of people. So it is the average citizen, it is the common man it is the ignorance of this common man which facilitates him stepping up for reasons of what he's been taught, propagandized as patriotism or fear of an enemy and forfeiting his life for the few who have anything to gain. People like I you and I, have yes, kids, Paula. My boys, I've told them from the beginning of time. I don't care how many children I have. I don't have one to spare. I better not ever see them talk to a recruiting officer without <laughs> the knowledge of this house. I, I, I don't have a, I don't have a life to spare in my house for their bloody games. And Absolutely every woman not. Should feel that way, and every father should feel that way. Now, I have I've had family members that served in the, uh, World War II and ways back as the uh, uh, Civil War and stuff like that. But it's it's done. This is this is done with mine. Well, I I would tend to agree with you a hundred percent. And see, I'm going. This entire show goes against the grain of my entire life up until a few years ago. Because many of you, of you have probably heard this, but maybe some of you have not. I worked, I'm an ex-military uh, individual. I served on nuclear submarines. I'm also an ex-employee uh, of one of the largest 
um, weapons building uh, companies in the military industrial complex, and that would be Raytheon. And all of the contracts I worked on for them, I was a senior field engineer working strictly DOD or Department of Defense contracts. I worked on weapon systems, countermeasure systems, sonar systems, radar systems. I worked on the mechanisms of war. Almost 40 years of my life, well, maybe 36 years of my life were dedicated to the war machine. And when you listen to me rant about this, you must understand, I know what I'm talking about. I lived it. I built it. I helped to facilitate it. And I was so propagandized as to believe that everything I did was out of necessity. I was saving the world. We were ridding the world of those damn commies. We were ridding the world of anything we didn't agree with. Only thing is, I can look back on that now and realize that it was all a lie. The massive wealth that has been accumulated by individuals within it, this country and many other countries in the free world like Great Britain and Japan and Germany uh, as a result of the war machine would boggle your mind. There are almost 500 billionaires in this country, yet there are between 16 and 20 million starving children in this country that live well below the poverty line. And in that case, a large amount of these billionaires have buried very uh, within their stock portfolios companies like Raytheon, companies like GE, companies like Boeing, companies like because no matter whether the economy is booming or not, warfare goes on. We've discussed this before. Let me bring this up again. They're cutting back on Social Security. They're cutting back on Medicare. They're cutting back on Medicaid. They're cutting hundreds, over $100 billion out of Medicare and Medicaid. I think it's actually like $234 billion over the next decade. They're cutting back on food stamps. They're cutting back on because we can't afford it anymore. We can't afford it. This country is beyond broke. But yet, the amount of money we spend on warfare, on the military-industrial complex, does not drop. And when the president or Congress tells you we're cutting the defense budget, it's a freaking lie! If they tell you we're cutting $20 billion out of the defense budget this year, which is a drop in the bucket, because almost 50 cents on every dollar that is spent within this country by this government goes to military or military-related spending. And there are some reports that will tell you it was as much as 53%. So if they cut $20 billion out, of a budget, a military budget that with everything thrown in could be as much as $1.5 trillion? It's chicken feed. But I'm here to tell you that when they tell you they're cutting that $20 billion out, it's a lie. Because what they take out of the front that you can see, they put into the black budget on the back end. And you're not allowed to know what that is or how much it is, or where it goes. I lived this for 36 years. I know of what I speak. I worked for one of the wealthiest and most prolific military god behemoths on this planet, Raytheon. So you and I need to tighten our belt. We need to, uh, they, they're introducing austerity measures. 
We can't afford, we can't afford. But yet, these military, this military industrial complex, which is made up of many military company, uh, companies that hold military contracts and build weaponry or so on and so forth, in some aspect with the military, they are making record profits. Why? Because we are, we've attacked Libya. We're, we've attacked the Sudan. We, we, we've got crap going on in Syria. And anybody who doesn't think we're not involved in Syria, get your head out of your butt. We're involved in Pakistan. We're involved in, we're doing things to Iran. Then we've got the, the old standbys we've been messing with for almost 15 years now. Iraq and Afghanistan. And when they tell you we pulled troops out of Iraq, are you an idiot? They pulled 12,000 troops out of Iraq, and then because of the possibility of some sort of a conflict the U U.S. might be involved in in Syria, they put 17,000 back in. But you don't know about that. They didn't take that on the news to make the president look good. They just, they heralded the 12,000 they pulled out. Between the paid soldiers, the mercenaries, and the active military, there's more in Iraq now than there was years ago. And now we're hearing the war in Afghanistan is over. We're going to be bringing our troops home. Do you want to bet? They can't afford to. Why? Because there's too many resources there that are highly valuable to those people who perpetrate these wars and propagate these wars and fund these wars and get rich off those wars. And one of them... One of them, one of the things they need are soldiers there to protect, and this boils my blood beyond anything you can believe, are the opium fields. A vast majority of the opium in the, on this planet today comes from Afghanistan. And prior to us declaring war and jumping in there and jumping bad all over that country, the Taliban had eradicated opium from Afghanistan almost a hundred percent and if you got caught growing opium you were dead I have nothing good to say about the Taliban and I'm not here telling you that they were good people they're not but when you consider that bumper crops year after year come out of Afghanistan and the profits being reaped from the opium trade of which our CIA and several other organizations and banks, global banks across the world that launder this money, this is a fact, Google it! How many banks have paid massive fines for laundering drug money on a global scale? If I make $50 billion off the drug trade and you give me a $3 billion fine, that's nothing more than a slap on the hand. It don't even hurt. It's done for the public to see. See, we found a bad guy and we made him pay. They don't tell you that the profit they made makes the penalty they just paid look like chicken feed. So where's the profit in warfare? If you think for one second they're going to pull all of the U.S. troops out of Afghanistan and give up the billions of dollars a year that these banks and the CIA and these elites make off of this global drug trade because the Taliban's going to step right back into that vacuum. Anybody who doesn't believe that is an idiot. And the first thing they're going to do is shut down the opium trade. That's a fact. 
So when you hear this president saying, we're going to be withdrawing from Afghanistan, the war is over, we've accomplished what we wanted to accomplish, that's bull! And for every soldier we pull out, we send in two mercenaries to take their place. If a soldier makes $30,000 a year, that mercenary is making eighty dollars to $120,000 a year. So tell me how they're cutting back on anything. Yet you and I, we better pull that belt a little tight because we have the services that we pay for. We, you and me, with our tax dollars, pay for are being cut back because we can't afford them. Now, we're paying more in taxes and getting less in services. And the military-industrial complex is getting fat beyond belief, and so are the bankers. Because, let me ask you a question, who do you think owns the military-industrial complex? The same people who own the United States of America, the same people who own, own, and I'll emphasize that word, our leaders, the same people who own the Federal Reserve, the same people who control the World Bank. It's not that the military industrial complex is getting rich and the bankers are getting rich. All that money goes to the same damn people. They all belong to the same club. And they swap board of director members around like we used to play musical chairs in grade school. This is reality. Anybody who doesn't think that warfare isn't a tool, a tool <coughs> to facilitate power, a tool to grab resources, a tool to eliminate an unwanted, unwashed population that might stand in the way of these oligarchs coming in and getting something they want. And we'll get into that a little bit more. Okay. Let's go on. If you think, as we are so often told, that war has spread across the Middle East in a progressive fashion tied to uh, protracted events as they unfold and mature. How does the Kool-Aid taste? America was destined to invade and occupy the Middle East since the mid-1990s. <clears throat> Plans were on the table to invade and occupy the Middle East as early as the 1990s, and some say maybe even earlier than that. What was always missing from this scenario, from this formula, was the catalyst. A reason to gain the willing support of the people and keep us engaged via the mechanism of patriot, patriotism and fear. This, my friends, was 9-11, the catalyst. And within days, not weeks, plans already many years old were being dusted off to occupy a resource-rich and strategically important segment of the globe, the Middle East. I know, because I did the research. Google... Um, the, the occupation of the Middle East uh, prior to the year 2000. And you will find that the discussion was already being had at the Pentagon. And the only reason we were aware of this was basically through whistleblowers. So what we see here <clears throat> is that 9-11 was the perfect trigger. <clears throat> we know that there are huge absolutely phenomenally rich veins of lithium in the Middle East. We know there is oil in the Middle East. We know and we can go on and on about other things that there are in the Middle East that we wanted. Not you and I, but our leaders. And it's not them that wanted it. It's their puppet masters who wanted it. 
So what we needed to do was build a mechanism by which we could demonize individual leaders to the point where we could whip up into a froth Americans in a patriotic froth either through the mechanism of patriotism or the mechanism of fear. If we don't go get them, they're going to come and kill us. They want to kill us for our rights and freedoms, our standard of living, the way we live. Well, I've got to explain something to you. Our standard of living is dropping through the floor. Our rights and freedoms are all but gone. They're now granted privileges. So, if this was the case, the war on terror should be long over. But yet, we demonized Gaddafi, who treated his people better than any other, and I'm not telling you he wasn't a despot, and I'm not telling you he didn't do bad things. What I am telling you is that Libya had one of the highest standards of living in Africa. That Libya had more, um, I don't know, perks via its government than even the United States gives its citizens. But let me pick up where we left off. <clears throat> so one of the initial mechanisms is to demonize a leader. We know Gaddafi was demonized. We know Assad's been demonized. We know that um, uh, everybody, everybody we've attacked has been demonized. Um, if you take a look at what happened in Iraq, same thing. Okay, But yet they took it a little bit further. It was weapons of mass destruction. Now, there's where the fear mechanism comes in, my friends, okay? Because with weapons of mass destruction, and I don't know if you remember back when, in 2000, in late 2001, early 2002, when we were making preparations and shaking our saber at Iraq and Saddam Hussein, uh, we had UN inspectors in there who could find nothing, but yet we constantly railed against the fact that they must have them and we could prove it. And we knew that they didn't have a long-range missile system, so the government's mind really works over time when we discuss things like this. They were talking about putting them on um, airplanes and crashing the airplanes. They were talking about putting them on ships and pulling them into ports. Not modern day delivery systems, but any way they could spark the mechanism of fear in America. And when you have a mainstream media that is complicit and you beat this into the people every night they hear weapons of mass destruction, weapons of mass destruction, planes coming down with dirty bombs, planes coming down with chemical weapons or biological weapons, ships pulling into port with dirty bombs or biological weapons. Um, you, you reach a point of saturation. You reach a point where the fear has saturated the people to the point where all they want to do is have this go away. And if that means taking the most powerful military on the face of the earth, belonging to the only superpower left on the planet at the time, and going in and eradicating this and making sure it can never happen, sure, we're all for that. Okay? We're all for that. They also tied, or tried to, it's never been proven. They also tried to tie him to the 9-11 issue. And even though there was no proof that Saddam Hussein was ever tied to the 9-11 issue, they beat it to death. Over and over again, we heard this. We suspect because. We believe there's ties. Never did they say we have absolute proof. What they said, constantly said is, we suspect. Well, if you tell a supposition enough, it becomes part of the psyche and you begin to believe it. So now it's the patriotism of getting paybacks in both Afghanistan and Iraq. And it's the fear from Iraq of possible WMD attacks against the American people. But yet, we can look back on that today unequivocally and know that it was bogus. Never, ever have weapons of mass destruction been found in Iraq. 
Now that's not to say that Iraq didn't use weapons of mass destruction because they did. They used gas against the Kurdish people in northern Iraq. They gassed them. Guess where they got the gas? Yeah, they got the gas indirectly from the good old USA. Stop and think about that. So if the, we ever did find weapons of mass destruction, just say we did, say we found some gas, some chemical weapons in um, Iraq, the good possibility, a very high probability, would be that they got it from us. So we demonized Gaddafi. All right, we demonized um, Saddam Hussein. We demonized and we demonized Assad, and we continue to do this because it falls back on that premise that we discussed: a benevolent action to rescue an enslaved or brutalized population from a despotic leader. Americans as a whole, not America, Americans as a whole, <clears throat> have a very good heart. To this day, even with our economy in the toilet and so many people hurting, we are still one of the most charitable nations on the planet. More people give to charitable organizations in this country than just about any other country on the planet. So do we want to go in and save all these poor people that are being rounded up and killed on a daily basis? If all of the reports of the people that had been killed on a daily basis in Libya and Iraq and in Syria were true, there would be no people left in those countries. And that might be a bit of an exaggeration, but I'm trying to make a point here. Where were the massive rallies in Tripoli or anywhere in Libya? Where were the massive rallies in Iraq? Except maybe the Kurds and they were too scared to rally because um, they wanted to get rid of all of them. Uh, we, what we see, what we saw in this country was a huge propaganda push that was so far, placed so far from reality, they didn't exist in the same dimension. Do some research! I'm not making this up! I can't make this up! Everything I'm telling you is based on fact, after the fact. We sent representatives, very high placed representatives to the UN <clears throat> because we didn't do a lot of this alone. A lot of this was done with NATO and UN help to convince them of weapons of mass destruction. Very high level, very key people. We had presidents who constantly discussed this. It was, we were all convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that we should fear for our lives or that these people had perpetrated this evil upon us and, uh, in, the, in, in the case of 9-11 and we should go in and ravage their countries. 3,000 people died <clears throat> in, in a little less than, I think it's 2,790 something people died in the 9-11 uh, attacks. Three million plus have died in the Middle East, either as a result, a direct result, a direct result of uh, warfare, an indirect result of warfare. And by indirect, which is a much larger portion of that category, let's discuss what that means. Uh, there are reports, Google this, of many, many Iraqi hospitals that couldn't even give you painkillers, couldn't give you uh, didn't have any antibiotics, didn't have, they didn't even have aspirin to give you for pain. So, if you didn't die from the bullet, you died from the infection. Or you died from disease. Or you died from birth defects. Or you died from, so let's take that out a little bit further. 
what's one of I don't know the biggest gifts we gave Iraq we have scattered across almost their entire countryside in high density millions of rounds of depleted uranium uranium deadly long-term exposure is I don't know causes massive cancer causes massive birth defects causes it's the gift it keeps on giving and it's still giving there are still people dying in Iraq that and it has nothing to do with hostilities that ended 10 12 14 years ago we did the same thing in Libya we've used the same weapons in Sudan we've given these weapons to uh, freedom fighters and that's a joke freedom fighters in Syria and I could go on there's a list of countries but we're going to get to that so let's proceed okay so I told you um, that 9-11 was the catalyst okay um, this my friends was the catalyst and as soon as 9-11 happened as I said plans came out of the drawers, the file cabinets they've been hiding in for years were dusted off and we were ready to go to war within days, not weeks after 9-11. The plans were already in place. The end result of this plan of ultimate tyranny was and is the enriching of the already mega rich, the institution of additional central style banks controlled by the elitist financial global robber barons the control of strategic lands and resources and the elimination or fatal weakening of the unwanted unwashed masses who may stand in the way of the accomplishments of the aforementioned plans <clears throat> you can't march into a country and start to kill their people and when your own government, our government, our government, admits that well over 90%, and some would say it's over 96%, of every person, every one of those 3 million people that plus that have died, is considered collateral damage, meaning they were just in the wrong place at the right time. And when everybody says wrong place at the wrong time, that doesn't make any sense to me. They were in the wrong place at the right time. So when 96 out of 100 people that were killed had absolutely nothing to do with anything evil towards this country, our freedoms, our way of life, anything, don't you think <clears throat> what you're going to do is perpetuate terrorism? I know if you walk into my house and you're a foreign soldier, and you kill my son or my daughter because you suspect they did something but you have no proof or you drop a bomb so close to my house that it kills my children that are out in the yard playing you've made an enemy and I will spend the rest of my life trying to kill you I want to hear from any parent out there listening to what I just said that you wouldn't do that I dare you to tell me you wouldn't do that because if you do then I don't want to know you you're not human now let's multiply that by times three million and don't you think these people who perpetuate this warfare don't understand this they don't know that they're going to be manufacturing terrorists freedom fighters within their own countries because we call them terrorists if you go over there they call them freedom fighters <clears throat> now for anybody who's gonna push back and say terrorists exist I agree with you but I would tell you that a very large majority of what we call terrorists are from the manufacture of 
actions we per perpetrated or perpetuated ourselves. We created them. So what do we do? What does this elite do if they want to be able to rape this country of the resources? If they want to be able to set up strategic bases to control what they consider to be strategic lands. What do they do? Well, gee, what you do is you go in and you absolutely level the infrastructure. You cause massive migration of populations into areas that can't support them. You, people are so worried about eating and keeping their family alive, but the last thing they can think about is getting even. Or you scatter depleted uranium across the countryside, causing massive cancers and sicknesses on a biblical scale, so that they're too sick or too worried about their family members that are sick to spend much time worrying about killing you. And if you think about this, you will agree with me. I just got done telling you that the massive majority of those three million deaths were not related to the bombs that were dropped or the bullets that were shot. Unless you consider the secondary causality of the depleted uranium bullets. Which is still the gift that just keeps on giving in multiple countries. So we sicken, we weaken, and we occupy with starvation a massive majority of their population which redirects them from the soldiers of occupation. Doesn't mean they all get redirected, but enough of them so it's now manageable. These are, these are all facts. But most people won't sit down and think about it this way. Don't you think that these people who are responsible for starting these wars under false pretenses haven't considered this? Don't you think they wouldn't have to consider this? I would tell you that if there are 40 million people in Iraq and there are 25,000 soldiers in Iraq, that if we didn't keep them busy with some other mechanisms, 25,000 soldiers wouldn't stay alive very long against 40 million irate Iraqis. Stop and think about that. Okay. Pregnant pause, but needed. Okay, what this this article has a a definite point to it, <clears throat> and that point is General Wesley Clark. What we allude to in this article <clears throat> is not an easy pill to swallow. If this is your first uh, foray into reality or your first trip down the rabbit hole, so we present just one scenario to you, and there are many. Believe me, I can give you many, and don't dare me to, because I'll do ten shows on just scenarios proving this. Um, centered, this is centered on the career of a military person, one who had the means and the wherewithal to know. Ask yourself this. As shocking as the revelations I'm about to tell you, and most of you already know these revelations, as blatantly as they point to or expose the complicity of our government and military with the global corporatist elite, what would be the reason for generally General Wesley Clark to lie about any of this? And doesn't what I'm about to tell you, and remember this point, fit exactly into the ongoing policy we see in play about a half a globe away from us? Let's start with General Wesley Clark making the claim that under, uh, uh, excuse me, that uh, as of 9-11, the United States went under, uh, underwent a policy coup. Now, he didn't say a military coup, he said a policy coup, which is basically a group of civilians who took over the policy making and enforcing 
of this country, took it out of the hands of those that were supposed to be doing it, and redirected it through a group of individuals who were, uh, gee, guess who they worked for? These would be the same corporatist elites who fund the wars, the same corporatist elites who own the military-industrial complex, the same corporatist elites who own the global banking system and control the world monetary system. There's a video included with this um, article, and anybody who looks at the article, I strongly suggest you look at the video because General Clark reveals that right after 9-11, he was privy to information contained within a classified memo. Remember, this was a, this was a four-star general. At that point in t time, they didn't get any higher than that. If you were a four-star, that was as far as you got. Okay, so um, he's basically at the top of the food chain. So, so he makes he makes the point. Hold on one second, please. All right, I just had an incoming message. Sorry about that, people. I'm one of these people who can't read a message on his computer and talk at the same time. I've never been really good at patting my head and rubbing my belly at the same time. But uh, when when the station sends me a message, usually it has something to do with my sound or whatever, so I feel it's important enough to excuse myself for a second or two and uh, to see to it. All right. Uh, the video, as I explained, uh, um, all of this was perpetrated immediately following 9-11. We're talking within a day or two, not weeks, not months, Okay. The general became uh, aware of and was privy to information contained in a classified memo, a four-star general. You, the U.S. plans to attack and remove governments in seven countries in five years. Do you understand what I just said? The U.S. had plans already drawn up. And I can tell you that these plans were drawn up in the middle 1990s, but there had never been a, cal a catalyst to launch them. 9-11 was that catalyst, which leads a lot of people to believe that puts that much more weight on the story. It wasn't 19 Muslims with box cutters, and even if it was, and the United States was aware of the plan, they did absolutely nothing because they knew it, knew it was the perfect catalyst. I won't go that far. I won't give them even that much credit. I believe the, United, the U.S. government was complicit in this, at least on some levels. But anyway, we're, we're, this, is, this is not all about 9-11. 9-11, again, here is just a catalyst. Uh, so, again, the plan um, that he became aware of was the U.S. government to attack and remove governments in seven countries over five years across the Middle East. Those countries were Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and Iran. Gee, do these names sound familiar to anybody? I can tell you right now, we're perpetrating hostilities in Iraq. I can tell you right now, we're perpetrating hostilities, whether it's through um, so-called freedom fighters, like the Muslim Brotherhood and others who want to kill us, that we're supporting in Syria. Um, I can tell you right now that we have actions going on in Lib Lebanon. I can tell you right now that um, we definitely have crap going on in Libya. I can tell you right now that we have special forces active in Somalia. I can tell you right now that we're doing drone strikes and special forces strikes in Sudan. And I can tell you right now that if we could, if we could get away with attacking Iran, we would have done so last week or the week before or the week before. But no, we're just trying to starve them out right now. But eventually, they will find the ultimate excuse to march across their borders. And that will be preceded by a bombing, a massive amount of bombing that will level their infrastructure. That's if the Soviet Union and China doesn't jump in. See, there's another key to that, and I'm about to get to that. He was told, all right, when he was given privy to this information uh, by his sources, we learned that we can use our military without being challenged. And we've got about five years 
to clean up the Soviet client regimes before another superpower comes along and challenges us. Gee, that would be the Soviet Union and China, who have already formed a pact monetarily and are starting to do exercises together militarily. Now, let's go back over a portion of that comment, okay? We learned that we could use our military without being challenged. In 2001 and early 2002, we had the unchallenged, most powerful military forces on the planet. The Soviet Union had crashed and burned. Most of the... Uh, what used to be countries that were absorbed by the Soviet Union into the Union due to their military strength and, uh, I don't know, basically marching in and taking over these countries, the satellite countries had broken away and declared their independence again. Russia had a ruble that had crashed and burned, so their money was worth nothing. They were selling their weapons on the black market just to get enough money to feed themselves. There was no threat coming from the Soviet, from Russia. China at that point hadn't reached the economic might that she displays today. And through that economic might, she has had in immense amounts of money to further uh, the sophistication and the amounts of her weapons and her weapon systems. So here it is, 2001, late 2001, early 2002, and uh, we're unchallenged. If we march into Afghanistan, if we march into Iraq, if we bomb Libya back to the Stone Age, uh, and, and I could go on, there was nobody to challenge us. But we have literally done perpetrated hostilities in every one of these seven countries except Iran. Hmm. I wonder why. Because backing Iran is the Soviet Union and China. And the Soviet Union has come a long way since 2001, 12, 13 years ago. And China has come a hell of a long way in the last 12 or 13 years. And maybe neither one of them together could stand up against the military power of the United States, but you put them both together and they more than equal the military might of the United States. So now we must take pause. And if you don't think this isn't upsetting some of these oligarchs, you're wrong. So we talk about a policy coup. All right. We talk about people stepping in in a undemocratic fashion and basically redirecting the policy of this country. From all of this comes the reasons we attack. The weapons of mass destruction. Massive lie. Okay. Um, I, I, for one, don't believe uh, that Osama bin Laden... Um, was in Tora Bora. I don't believe that, uh, and even if he was, how could the world's most efficient, most powerful, and um, the, the only superpower left on the planet allow him to escape through a simple mountain pass in a convoy of vehicles into Pakistan? So the lies just kept building and building. And these oligarchs realized and the reason they took over this or, or made this policy coup was because they had at their disposal through their puppets the most powerful military force this planet had ever seen the United States military and the most profitable and the most industrious military industrial complex this planet had ever seen that of the United States. But let's go through a couple of under, other points, okay? Um, just who are these people that are mentioned that pulled this coup? Hmm. Could those be the people who stood to gain the most 
in wealth and power? Well, that's what we just discussed. And I had also stated that we had five years to clean up the Soviet satellites before another superpower gained enough strength or regained enough strength to challenge us. Okay. Clean up what? What did we have to clean up? What about the ex-Soviet client regimes had to be cleaned up? None of them had eyes on attacking the United States. None had the means to even pose a threat to the world's only remaining superpower. No, my friends, it was never about what we had that they wanted to attack us for. It was about what they had and what the puppet masters wanted to have. Whether it was lithium, whether it was oil, whether it was opium, whether it was a strategic position within that part of the world, whether it was about a pipeline, all of these things we see happening today. And if you were the most powerful people on this planet, and you controlled the most powerful military on this planet, and it didn't cost you a penny to use that military, it doesn't cost them anything to use it. You and I pay for that military. We pay for it. And they use it at their discretion. So they have two choices. They can either go in and try through uh, monetary or diplomacy um, reasons or, or, or fashions to get the rights to those resources or to get the rights to put strategically put a pipeline or to get the rights. But that's going to cost them billions of dollars. Why should they do that? Do some research. They don't have to do that. They have the world's most powerful stick, the biggest stick, and they can beat anybody over the head they want to with it, and it doesn't cost them a frickin' penny. They actually make money off of it because they own the companies that build the missiles and the tanks and everything else that's going to be used in that warfare and they sell them to us and you and I pay for them. Then they use it to get what they want. Can you see that they, they have no way to lose here and you and I have no way to win here? We pay for them to get what they want, and in a lot of cases, we pay with American lives. And they don't give a damn. We're cattle. If we lose 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 Americans by the time we back our stupid butts out of the Middle East, do you think one of them is going to shed a tear? And if you do, I want their name. You're paying for this. I'm paying for this. They're not paying for this. They're just using it freely and at their own discretion. This is what the policy coup was. There were those who would never have agreed to this. There are those who would have dug into it, who would have proved the propaganda to be lies. They couldn't have that. So they had to facilitate a coup by which they put their people into the positions to make these policies. People like Wolfowitz. People like, I don't know, I could go down a long list of people. Brzezinski. Okay? Um, just the most evil people in the world. The people you can guarantee yourself if there's a council on foreign relations meeting, they're going to be sitting in the freaking front row. These are the top level puppets. Because even they are puppets. Even they do the biddings of their masters. So if you get a chance... Please watch the video that's in this article. Basically, it's going to tell you what we went over, but you're going to hear it from a four-star general, or at this point, an ex-four-star general. 
and understand this is the point that he's talking about. In American history, when tyranny accelerated exponentially against not only those countries I listed, but also against we the people with ramifications never conceived of before. Never. When I was growing up, if you'd have told me I no longer had the right to free speech, I no longer had the right to assemble, I no longer had the right uh, to reasonable privacy, I no longer had any of my rights. I could go down the whole list. They would be granted privileges by a tyrannical government. If you had told me that, do you think I would believe you? But I dare, I dare anybody listening to prove me wrong. I dare you. Because you can't. And anything you throw to me that you feel is proof, I will chew it up and spit it out so fast your head will spin. Everything I'm standing to you is fact, but I am the person who connects the dots. So many people out there know about this point, or this point, or this point. I spend hundreds of hours every month connecting dots. Looking at the big picture and seeing how each one of these little dots affects the outcome. How did we get here today? We didn't get here today because we walked down one road. We got here today because they took a hundred thousand paths that all converge at the same damn point where we are right now. There were people out there that told me I couldn't connect the dots between GMOs, um, chemtrails, and vaccines. But anybody who listened to those shows and didn't come away with the knowledge that they were all very, very connected didn't listen to the shows. And again, everything I state is provable. Everything I stated today is fact. But most people won't step back far enough to look at that picture. There are too many people in this country that honestly believe that we are in five, six, seven, eight nations in over 150 countries on this planet, we have a military presence, special forces, because we have to fear for our freedom. There are people that honestly believe that. They, they believe that to their core. There are people to this day who believe we marched into Iraq because weapons of mass destruction were going to rain down on America. There are people who believe that we took over an entire country and beat it into submission, Afghanistan, because of one man, Osama bin Laden. And don't understand that we have pulled so much up out of Afghanistan. And to this day, to this day, the reason the opium trade booms across this entire planet is because your sons and daughters in the military march those fields every day and protect anybody from going in and stealing them or burning them down. That's why there's heroin in the streets of America. Yep. Stop and think about that. And who makes the money off of that? If you think it's the local drug dealer, you're insane! You're an idiot! It's the big banks and the CIA that use that money to fund. The CIA uses drug money, and this is, Google this, this has been common knowledge for 20 plus years. Uses drug money to fund black projects. And the big banks, they launder that money at a profit that just absolutely would bend you over backwards if you understood how much money they make off of the global drug trade. And a huge portion of that is the opium coming out of the biggest opium supplier on the planet, which is Afghanistan, which is under the control of the United States and under the protection of the United States military.
I was told <clears throat> by somebody who I discussed this show with prior to doing it, actually I discussed it with him last week, that connecting the global oligarchs to warfare and to the drug trade and to um, the mechanisms of warfare, uh, initiating warfare, um, was going to be something hard to do and something most people wouldn't understand. I would dare say, anybody who listened to this show today, what would you say, Paula? Do you think I put it simple enough so people could understand it? I think so, Roger. <laughs> Absolutely. I don't know how else, how much clearer he can be. But it's the truth. And again, <clears throat> if it's not the truth, and you know, I, I know I clear my throat a lot, but I, that's because when you when you scream a lot, <laughs> it irritates your throat. And this is the second um, show I've done today where I've gotten a little bit more than angry. But it's things like this that actually do make me angry because... All of this is based on two things. All of it. Everything we discussed today is based on two very simple principles. Patriotism and fear. And it's the fear that actuates the patriotism. It is. Fear, as I have told you over and over again, and I will probably say over and over again in the future, fear is the ultimate control mechanism. If you fear for the lives of your children, if you fear for the lives of your family, if you fear for the lives of your neighbor, if you fear for the destruction of your country, then your patriotism will flare. You don't become patriotic because the guy down the street is playing jacks or riding his bike backwards or throwing a bone for his dog. That doesn't bring your patriotism out. What brings your patriotism out is the threatening of your lifestyle or the lifestyle or the safety of the people you love and care about. 9-11! The biggest spike in fear and patriotism in this country since World War II. And if you don't think it wasn't done intentionally, if you don't think it wasn't choreographed to do exactly what it did, if you don't think that that wasn't the exact mind frame they wanted to put you and I in, if you're afraid that somebody's going to come and kill you, if you're afraid that Muslims are going to infiltrate this country and plant dirty bombs all around the United States, you're not going to give up your rights. You're not going to look at your neighbor and say, so what if they're listening to my phone calls? Maybe they'll catch a terrorist. I'm not doing anything wrong. What you have just done is acquiesce to the usurpation of an unalienable right. And in your mind, you can't understand that. But that's what you've just done. And who has done that? That would be the people who have the most to gain by totally controlling this country and its military. They don't give a damn that the country's falling apart. They don't give a damn if we've got starving children. They don't give a damn if over a hundred million Americans are either unemployed or, or underemployed. They don't give a damn because it's not you and me they want. It's our military. It's the big stick. And every time our standard of living drops a little, they'll raise our taxes just enough to keep us paying for that military. Because they don't want to pay for it. They just want to use it. Tell me where I'm wrong. I dare you. I dare you to prove to me that one single reason we marched into any country in the Middle East is 100% the truth. Or even 50% the truth. I dare you. Because you can't. I can pull apart just about anything you're going to use in defense. So they use the biggest stick on the block, and we pay for it. 
And we not only pay for it with our blood and our sweat and our tears, we pay for it with our liberties, our freedoms, and our rights. Because if you don't take our rights and our freedoms away, eventually we're going to wake up to this. And a lot of people are. And they knew this was coming. Hey, 2.2 billion bullets they bought. How many? V- uh, I mean, how many 30,000 drones in the American skies? Do you? Th- what do you think that's there for? What do you think that's there for? Because they were, they knew there would come a time when we would say enough is enough. And at that point, they wanted us to be so subjugated there would be, we'd be impotent. There wouldn't be much we could do. So this is the introduction to the new series. This is the introduction to <clears throat> warfare, a tool. And next week, because I didn't get into it this week, and I'm very good at putting up two articles and only getting through one, but next week we're going to discuss the nuclear war option. And I will say some things and show you some things that will absolutely rock your foundation. Because nobody has really discussed this since the end of the Cold War. And if you think that that threat has disappeared, oh, you of such great naivety. Paula, I want to thank you. I want to thank Awake Radio. And if you would like to put a word in for any of your affiliates, I'd appreciate it. Absolutely. I would like to thank 1800 1800- online.weebly.com we go out there every Saturday night same time also www.shazizradio.com slash knights of the round table same thing we're aired there it was a wonderful station <coughs> stop by these changing times with a z instead of a s radio.ning.com it's a wonderful station. You'll love it. They all carry us live. And thank you all very much. And Paula, thank you for actually saying more than two words tonight. It was very pleasant, my friend. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you, Roger. <laughs> Good night, all. <laughs>